You're very welcome to Radio Spoil, episode 16. Let's take it away. Radio Espoil is a series of podcasts brought to you across the internet by TIPM Media. Presented by investigative journalist Mick Rooney, it covers a host of topics from international media, publishing, aviation, and technology. Thank you for listening to this podcast today. Today we'll be talking about the case of Trevor Dealey, missing Irishman, and uh, we'll be going through the timeline uh, in a very in-depth way. You can follow us on uh, Twitter, Radio Aspile, uh, SoundCloud, many other podcasting and video casting places. That's what we do here, video casting and podcasting. Okay, let's get on with it for another episode. Please feel free to leave a comment and visit our links provided in this podcast production. Thank you for your support. Okay. Um, as I say, it's quiet now. Won't be any more of that music. Radiospoil.com. Uh, we're available on Twitter. Um, we're dealing with a missing case file uh, today. Uh, it's Trevor Dealey. I'm going to tell you uh, a little bit of the background of that case. And what we're then going to do is we're going to work through a little bit like we did with, with the Gabby Petito case. We're going to work through fairly in-depthly into the timeline. Uh, again, I'm going to intersperse that with images uh, and very significantly in this case, CC, 
uh, TV footage plays a very important role. Now, if you're just looking for a summary of this case, in the next five minutes, you've probably captured a lot of it. Uh, if you're not interested in the detailed timeline, that's okay. I understand that. But we will be going uh, in depth into that timeline. I'm going to try and curtail this, uh, the Gabby Petito uh, episode that we did, episode 15. You can check that out in YouTube or various other um, uh, platforms, Radio Spoil. Um, that ran for nearly four and a half hours, and I think it in genuine it was too much. Uh, I didn't expect it to run that long. Uh, there was a lot to put in it, and I want to try and curtail this a little bit more. Uh, so without further ado, I'm going to give you some background on the case of Trevor uh, Dealey. This is not, I want to emphasize, a recent missing person case. This actually goes right back uh, to very early 2000s. Um, let's get on with it. On the 8th of December 2000, Irishman Trevor Dealey disappeared in Dublin. Dublin, Ireland, obviously. He had been walking home around 4 a.m. from his office uh, Christmas party and had needed to go to the bank where he worked for an umbrella as well as to get certain things in order for his shift the next day. He was seen on a security camera at his bank and in front of another bank he passed as he headed home on foot. Both also captured a man clad in dark clothing who was yet to be identified and is considered likely to have played a role in Dealey's disappearance. We're gonna talk an awful lot about, as I say, C uh, C T V footage uh, and it's gonna play an, an important part into this case. This is quite uh, again an in-depth case. Uh, to go on, Trevor Dealey was born on the 15th of August 1978. His parents are Michael and Anne Dealey. He's the youngest of four siblings. He grew up in Nace County Kildare in Ireland. After finishing school, Dealey studied business at the Waterford Institute of Technology but dropped out in his second year. He subsequently subsequently completed a computer course in Dublin. In May 1999, he began working in the IT department of Bank of Ireland Asset Management on Leeson Street, which is in Dublin. In late November 2000, just weeks before his disappearance, Dealey flew to Alaska in the United States. He flew on a discount that his friend procured for him to his role as a long haul flight attendant, which his friend described as free. He went over to see a girl that he had met in Dublin during the summer while he was holidaying in Ireland. Now, <coughs> the Christmas party on the 8th of December plays a key point that that is effectively the evening he disappeared the December the 8th moving into the early morning of December 9th the Christmas party was scheduled excuse me uh, the Christmas party was scheduled for Thursday the 7th of December uh, moving into uh, December the 8th after drinks in Copperface Jack's a uh, well-known uh, Dublin establishment bar uh, and the Hilton Hotel, the party moved to Book Wally's nightclub on Lower Leeson Street. Dealey left Book Wally's at about 3.25 a.m. He started walking in the direction of his apartment in the Renware complex on Serpentine Avenue in Balls Bridge. There was a heavy storm that night with gusts as high as 60 to 70 miles per hour and there was also a taxi strike. And that's an important detail to remember. About 10 minutes after leaving the nightclub, Dilly arrived at his office and was let in after calling security. We'll go through the whys and what? 4 a.m. in the morning, what would you be doing going to your office? We'll go into that. 
While in his office, Dealey made a cup of tea and spoke to a colleague, Carl Pender, who was working the night shift. He also checked his emails and made a note of things he needed to do and work the following morning. He left the office at 4.03 a.m., taking an umbrella with him, and it continued in the direction of Balls Bridge. Around the time he rang a friend of his in Nace, he left a voicemail. His friend described the message as saying, Hi Glenn, I missed you there, just on my way home, all going good, I'll talk to you tomorrow. Or words very closely to that effect. His friend deleted the message, not regarding it as significant, and investigators never sought to retrieve it. CC footage CCTV footage shows that a man dressed in black was waiting outside the gates of the bank for approximately half an hour before Dealey arrived. When Dealey arrived, they had a brief conversation at the gates. Two minutes after Dealey entered the bank, two more men arrived at the gate. While they have since been cleared as colleagues of Dealey, the man in black remains a person of interest. By the time Dealey left the bank, this man was no longer waiting outside. At 4.14 a.m. CCTV footage shows Dealey walking past what was then the AAB bank on the corner of Baggett Street Bridge and Haddington Road in the direction of his flat. About 30 seconds later, a man dressed in black passed by the AIB bank. Gardy said that they believe this is the same man who spoke to Dealey outside his office. This man has never come forward to Gardy despite numerous appeals over many years since the disappearance. This footage represents the last known sighting of Dealey. Dealey's absence from work the following morning was not seen as a cause for concern as it had been a late night. Additionally, his flatmates were away that weekend so they did not know he was missing either. Only when Dealey failed to show up the following Monday morning were alarm bells raised. His work informed his family. After asserting that nobody had spoken to Dealey that weekend, they reported him as a missing person. Over the following days, Dealey's family and friends put up hundreds of posters, handed out thousands of leaflets and went from house to house and business to business inquiring if people had seen him. His friends were able to obtain the CCTV footage used in the Garda investigation. Detective Sergeant Michael Fitzgerald, who worked on the case from the beginning, said, I've never worked on a case where the family were so proactive. The delay between Dealey being last seen and reported as missing meant that vital time was lost. We've talked about that before in missing um, case files. The Garda Subakwit team searched the River Dodder close by and the Grand Canal but did not find anything. They were unable to drain the Grand Canal basin as it would affect the structural integrity of the surrounding buildings. Dealey's sister Michelle said that she rang his phone a few times the weekend he went missing and she believes that it rang out. According to Dr. Philip Perry, a senior research fellow in the Radio and Optical Communications Laboratory in Dublin City University, a phone in 2000 would have gone dead within seconds of falling into the water. However, Michelle said she is not 100% sure that it did actually ring. Dealey's whereabouts remain unknown and the case continues to spark interest. A special documentary hosted by Dono McIntyre aired on TV3 in Ireland in 2015. Moving on, in December, and you can see how progressed this case is and how long it's been going on. In December 2016, a new investigation was opened. The following April, enhanced CCTV footage was released leading to the announcement by Gardy that they believed that the man dressed in black seen behind Dealey on the Haddington Road footage was the same man that he spoke to outside uh, the bank offices. That same month, a €100,000 reward was offered for information. In August 2017, 
Garda began a search of a three acre secluded area in the Dublin suburb of Chapel Lizard, about eight kilometres from where Dealey was last seen. An informant alleged that Dealey was murdered on the night of his disappearance by a Crumlin based criminal known to Gardaí. The gang he was in was involved in the drugs and prostitution trade in the area where Dealey disappeared. The same gang was investigated for the murder of Sinead Kelly in June 1998. The informant said that Dealey and his alleged murderer had not known each other and it was a chance encounter. Although a gun and drugs were found during the search, investigators concluded that they were not related to the case, calling the site a stash area for criminals. The search was called off in September and Gardy said at the time that they had not found anything that would assist them in the Trevor Dealey case. Two Gardy uh, did travel to Alaska to speak to the girl who Dealey had gone over uh, previous to his disappearance. Um, Dealey's sisters uh, also travelled to Alaska separately for the same purpose. Ultimately, uh, the trips produced no leads and there's no circumstance that his trip to Alaska was related to his subsequent disappearance in uh, Dublin in uh, early December. Now, again, we have a lot to get through. So what we're going to do now is we're going to move into a more detailed uh, examination of the actual timeline. And we're going to do this by dates. And I'm going to reflect on some of what we've just touched upon here. And I'm going to much more expand on it. Okay, so uh, let's go and do that and go to the timeline. Okay, we all set. Um, let's start with the timeline. Uh, I'll go through this with inserts regarding uh, the relevance of it. This is obviously refers to the potential three men outside the uh, bank itself at 3.37, um, two minutes after uh, Trevor entered the building there. You can uh, see Trevor himself, handsome man as he was. Um, I'll touch on this a little bit in a, in a while and, and this goes to, I think, the core of the case. But where I'm going to start is here. May 1999, uh, Trevor Dealey, age 21, starts work at Bank of Ireland Asset Management on Wilton Terrace. Uh, just to intervene, I will have inserts, video inserts, as well as image inserts, so you'll understand better the journey that Trevor took that night, the places he went to, and what have you, so don't worry, that will be included. So Trevor is the son of uh, senior board BA official Michael Dealey, originally from Lockeray and now living in Nace. Trevor has two sisters, Pamela and Michelle, and a brother, Mark. 2000, Trevor moves into an apartment in the Renoir Complex in Serpentine Avenue, Sandy Mount, Dublin 4. He shares the apartment with two female flatmates, <coughs> Neve and Sharon, and we'll do an insert there, so just so you can look at the uh, area. And the apartment itself. November 2000, Trevor leaves for a holiday in Alaska. According to family and friends, he had previously met Karen, a girl from Alaska, while she was visiting Ireland uh, in late November, uh, December. That, that was obviously in 1999. Uh, Tuesday, December 5th, 2000, Trevor arrives back in Dublin. 
uh, from his trip from Alaska. He catches a bus from Dublin Airport to Nace and stays for a short time. According to his father, Michael Daly, Trevor told his parents they would not be down that following weekend. Okay, so we're on December the 5th. <coughs> Wednesday, Wednesday, December the 6th, 2000. Trevor returns to work at Bank of Ireland, so he's back to work now after his trip at the Asset Management Building. Now, just before I go on, and we'll get into this a little bit later, I want to just stress that the Asset Management Building is this it's it kind of think of it like an administration building where it stuff went on you know software fielding support that kind of thing this this wasn't a place where there was a box of gold bunion hidden in the cellar or there was millions of pounds hidden there this when when we say the asset asset management building this wasn't a bank in the sense of a public bank where there were vaults and vast amounts of money kept there. I want you to keep that in mind when we get into talking about, you know, fucking conspiracy theories and ideas like that. Okay, so just keep that in mind. This was a resource building, an administration building. This wasn't a public bank where vaults of money were kept. All the areas mentioned, Wilton, uh, Wilton Terrace, Copper Face Jacks, the, Ho the Hilton Hotel, which is where the work party was later, Book Wallies, uh, are all within 5 to 15 minutes walking distance of each other. Again, we'll, we'll show that where I insert it on the map. Now, <coughs> we're into the crucial day. Thursday, December the 7th, 2000, 4 p.m. Trevor finishes work at Bank of Ireland Asset Management. He later attends a drinks reception in Copper Face Jacks before the staff annual Christmas party in the Hilton Hotel, Shalomon Place. Now, we're not certain if when Trevor fil uh, finished work at 4 p.m. that he actually went back home. It's not that considerable a distance. It's quite possible he did, but we don't have details on that. I have a strong suspicion he did, and I have no basis for that, because the apartment where he was staying, by that stage, 4 p.m., as I believe on Thursday, was vacant. There was nobody there. So no, there are no reports that anybody's seen him. We don't have... Uh, uh, telecom traffic to indicate whether he did or he didn't. Maybe the Gardaí have that, the, the Irish police, uh, but we don't know. But I have a suspicion he did not go to um, the initial meeting point with friends before the Christmas party in the Hilton Hotel. That So we're not sure of his movements between 4 p.m., and what happened slightly later over those two hours. In Without Trace by Barry Cummins, it is reported that in the afternoon, Trevor visited his father's office. So we're fairly sure this did happen. So he leaves work and goes to the father's office in Mount Street. Again, it's not far away. To collect contact lenses sent there by Trevor's brother, Mark, an, opt an optician. It is further stated that Trevor did not see his father, Michael Dealey, during the visit as Mr. Dealey was out at, at, at the time visiting a number of locations as part of his job. According to Michael Dealey, Sunday Independent 23rd of the 12th, 2012, Trevor phoned him that evening from his apartment in Ballsbridge. And this is, this is the, I did say the, the, there's limited traffic of the actual movement. Because remember back then, it was much more difficult to track someone's phone. So this is confirmation from his father, at least indicating that his son contacted him 
suggesting he was indeed in his apartment in Ballsbridge to say that there was something wrong with the electricity and then uh, phones were, came back on again to say that he had spoken to the ESB and got the electricity uh, fixed. <coughs> and that's the evidence we have that strongly suggests Trevor did leave work at 4 p.m. and travel directly back home. But it's only an account of what his father uh, said. And I don't doubt what his father said. I do believe Trevor went back home. Unfortunately, we don't have proper telecom tracking that where his phone was, which would you would assume was with him, where he his location actually was but there's a strong indication travel left work and did not go heading to the park because that really wasn't starting till later that evening six seven eight o'clock that night <coughs> so this account indicates that Trevor returned to his apartment at Ballsbridge before going out this is being established as fact by on Garda Irish police and this is true interviews with the parents that after leaving work at 4 p.m. Trevor did indeed return home before leaving again sometime after 7 p.m. However, little is known about his movements and activities between 4.30 p.m. when he arrived home and later when he arrived at Copper Face Jacks. Copper Face Jacks is a well-known sort of bar nightclub in Dublin at the time. Uh, I believe it still exists now. Um, in the same interview Michael Dealey says that his final conversation with his son was by phone when Trevor was already at Copper Face Jacks that phone call occurred sometime around 7.30 to 8.30pm Trevor was very active in his, in his time but few details from mobile data activity have been publicly disclosed between the critical hours up to 8.45pm the one thing I'll note there is, and this played into the whole what happened over the that weekend, that infamous weekend. It's very clear that Trevor wasn't somebody who didn't talk to his parents or would, you know, go sort of absent communicating with them for a number of days. This, you know, it's very clear here. Trevor was somebody who communicated with his parents, if not, re it, it, you know, on a, almost a day-to-day -day basis, they knew where he was and they knew where he was going. 8.45 p.m., okay, this is really where the, the night is kicking off for Trevor and his friends. They leave Copper Face Jack, so they've been there for a period of time. So the estimate is he arrived maybe sometime around 7.30, 8 o'clock, they're there for a short time to have drinks. They leave for the Hilton Hotel, which is in Charlemagne Place, which is where the actual official office party is being held, a very short distance away. This was the work party event. Copper Face Jacks was simply an early local rendezvous, uh, a few arranged to meet. So not everybody was meeting there, just Trevor and a few of his workmates met there, first of all, quite a common thing with a, a work to do, you'd meet somebody in a place just beforehand and then you'd all troop down to, again, this is all very, very localised area. Now, the night progresses. Sometime between 11 and 11.30 p.m., again, contact. Trevor receives a call from his friend, Glenn Cullen, but it is too noisy to talk. He's obviously in the Hilton Hotel, uh, the Christmas party. The two friends miss each when they call back. So they don't actually talk. They, they uh, kind of that evening attempt to call each other, but each misses each other's call. Again, quite commonplace to happen in a busy environment where it's loud, there's a lot going on, and you're occupied, you're distracted with friends, and... It's fun and festivities. Remember again, it's Christmas. Okay, Friday, 8th of December. Now remember, the, the evening started on the 7th of September. We're now into the 8th of September, the very early hours. It's 2 a.m., okay? 
Christmas party is winding down. Trevor and friends leave the Hilton Hotel for Buck Wally's, it's another bar, in Leeson Street. This will be a natural late night move for Trevor. It's close and it's also, importantly, it's still close to his Serpentine Avenue uh, home. 3.35 a.m. And now we're really getting into the, the crucial nitty gritty of this. Trevor arrives alone. CCTV footage. Please watch it. I've included it. At the gate of his office. So everything I'm describing here is what you're seeing in the CCTV footage. Okay, so this is... The guy uh, uh, in clad in black standing outside of the back of Trevor's workplace. And he's behind the pillar. You can see the timestamp. We're at 3.05. It's jumped to 3.33. The guy is still there. So this guy's been hanging around for a considerable amount of time. So again, follow the timestamp. Early hours of the morning, 8th of the 12th, we're at 3.34 now. And here's Trevor coming into the picture. Top right, sorry, top left. You'll see a different, and the guy starts, appears to start following him towards the gate. Now we're at the gate in a separate uh, CCTV footage. It's not as good this TV footage uh, there's clearly some uh, light dispersal uh, from street lights that are you know glistening you can see the, the moisture on the ground from the rain guy just gone out of picture again behind the pillar in black here's Trevor coming up to the gate uh, Carl Pender had already picked up a delivery and had left the uh, chain i believe off the gate unlocked uh, so trevor could come in again it's not certain did trevor have any communication with carl pender the guy there they have a few words outside the gate but that's really the end of it it's short this is trevor now at 402 he's He's been in there, what, 25 minutes. He's leaving the bank. Uh, he struggles a little bit with his umbrella uh, to get it up. Looks out across the road. Umbrella up and now he's walking back towards uh, Serpentine. Uh, this is Hallington Road 414 so this is a good what 12 13 minutes later there's Trevor umbrella up this was the initial CCTV footage released to the public uh, for assistance and you can see what oh, less than 30 seconds 20 30 seconds there's the guy clad in black that police are certain that is the same man. In Wilton Terrace, initially on CCTV. So this is where things go somewhat awry. Security footage shows a man waiting outside the office for approximately half an hour before Trevor's arrival. That's what's important that we see in the CCTV footage because Trevor Trevor arrives, but the man waiting outside appears to be have been loitering around for a considerable time, at least half an hour beforehand, in that area, close by that area. Now I have the man runs to talk to Trevor out. Not quite sure the CCTV quite shows he runs to talk to him, but he certainly very positively moves towards him to talk to Trevor. 
having been loitering around at, at a pillar and nearby. Uh, when he arrives at the gate and they have a brief conversation, now that brief conversation literally is the way I would perceive it from the CCTV is it's like it's like arriving somewhere and going to unlock a door and somebody distracts your attention as you're unlocking that door or going in a gate or you, you, you're just delayed moving in and out and somebody distracts your attention and tries to get you into conversation it's very clear it's a brief conversation literally less than 20 seconds uh, there is no sense there is a connection between the black clad man and Trevor it it almost seems awkward it's like just oh, you know get in here and away from this fella kind of thing you know uh, he's trying to engage me in conversation I'm not really interested in and at the same time Trevor struck everybody as an affable fella so probably exchanged a few words but clearly you know get in here um, I, I don't really want to be delayed at this gate trying to get in um, so Trevor enters through the gate which is locked but unchained so um, this is the question I have and I, I raised this in the CCTV footage I'm still uncertain whether Trevor had a conversation with Carl Pender who was the guy he met inside whether Carl Pender knew he was arriving and that there had been some cellcom exchange phone exchange between the two of them and he knew he was arriving and went down to unlock the gate according to Pender there was a delivery of some kind late that night I, I have no details on it but he unlocked the gate like a chain and a padlock but left the chain around it and I can only presume from that what why would he have done that left it unlocked not just for the delivery but why wouldn't he have just relocked it I, I don't know so Again, I want to be wary of speculation. My suspicion is that Carl knew that Trevor might be arriving that evening and that there could have been some exchange that we are not aware of in the public eye and has not been released from Angarda Sheikhan of the Irish Police. The initial footage in isolation suggests there is some lonesome man, perhaps homeless, on the street on a bad weather night. Now, I want to emphasize this this particular night was a horrendous night. Very heavy rain, extremely blustery winds, strong winds. Uh, there was a taxi strike that night. Uh, it really wasn't a night you wanted to be standing outside anywhere. And without trace, a documentary on the case that has stated that Trevor was left was let in the gate by a security guard. Uh, Peter, a few minutes earlier, Peter had taken the chain off the gate for delivery of internal posts. Trevor thanked Peter for letting him in. Now, what's interesting is the CCTV footage is from the bank if Peter went out to unlock the chain the, the, the lock on the chain at the gate uh, for a delivery of internal post when we say internal post it means it, it an internal post coming from another bank or assortment of bank um, so You know, it, it, it leaves me puzzled. Why haven't we seen CCTV footage of Carl Pender coming out on a lock and the I would have thought that was quite critical and important, even for the public, to let the full sequence of CCTV unfold. How long before 
Carl Pender took that delivery and unlocked the chain, the, the, the lock, the chain lock on the gate, was it when Trevor arrived at 3.35 a.m.? Why can't we see that CCTV footage? How long transpired? Did Carl Pender know that Trevor was arriving? Why would he have left it unlocked if he didn't know he was arriving? Was there communication between the two beforehand? Who knows? 3.36 a.m. Trevor speaks to his work colleague, Carl Pender. He's inside now. Asking him if, if he has time for a cup of tea. According to Pender, he had something to do at the time and asked Trevor to wait. 3.37. And this is crucial now because this is only more in recent years being disclosed. Security footage shows the man who spoke to Trevor standing outside the gate with another man. And I believe if you watch the CCTV footage, this is the man standing right very close up. And you can actually see him. Of all the three people, the man with the umbrella, man in black, and then the guy standing the other side. You can actually see him quite visibly glaring inside. This is the man is being referred to here. Now, it says there is a man, there is a third possibly unconnected figure behind him. I think that's the man with the umbrella. And yeah, it's it's not certain that he's connected to the two men. Okay, so this is the CCTV footage. Uh, you've just seen it there, 337. But let's start at the 334. This is... Uh, as Trevor arrives at 3.35 uh, Man in Black uh, we've already seen this from the first uh, CCTV footage but this is the kicker really for me this is what the public were not shown and not until the McIntyre documentary of 2015 clearly Gardy were aware that there was an awful lot more going on outside that gate at the time and didn't show us and here we go this is 3.37 so Trevor's already in the building more than two minutes and we now have three men standing outside one with an umbrella our man in black and another guy uh, standing to the other side staring in so we've got three people out here now, maybe the guy in the umbrella is unconnected. We don't know. Clearly, that's our man in black. And clearly, there's another guy there staring in. It's clear that there has to be some connection with these men. At least two of them. And it's disturbing that it took till 2015... For this to be disclosed publicly and this is put down to two of uh, um, two of uh, Trevor's colleagues standing outside that's crap that's nonsense Trevor's colleagues never came forward and said they stood outside uh, the building that evening they left him when he left uh, book Wally's and went to the bank What was puzzling is the Gary have said that two of these men were Trevor's colleagues. <sighs> um, at no point have Gary substantiated this claim. At least one man clearly isn't. I believe the man with the umbrella. Because CCTV in the area shows him loitering in the area and no connection to Trevor. He is later the man following Trevor. So that's our man in black. So there's connection there and interest in Trevor as he enters. The man with the umbrella could be completely disconnected. The man staring in the gate beside the man in black later at 2.37 appears to be clearly connected to the man clad in black. Now, here's my, my concern here. Why have Ungarda Shikhan suggested that they were two work colleagues? 
No work colleague of Trevor Dealey in 21 years has ever come forward and says, oh yeah, that's that's me at the gate. Oh, we were waiting for Trevor outside. Yeah, we left Book Wally's. Um, he said he might head back to the office. And then we thought, you know, oh, we'll just in the pissings of rain, just head up there and loiter outside and wait for him to come out and yeah, whatever. Sorry, I, I don't buy it. No work colleague has ever come forward, to my knowledge, publicly, whatever they told on Garda Shikana, that there were ever two work colleagues outside. I think this is a complete misnomer. And I'm concerned about this kind of disinformation and that on Garda Shikana have not shut this down because there is no evidence whatsoever in this case that two work colleagues were ever present outside those gates. Over the last two years, I've asked Ungarda Shikana to respond to the claims that colleagues of Trevor were outside. Other journalists have, and they've refused to respond. I think they know it's misinformation. They've fucked up. Before I and Trevor's family have been concerned by the hidden insinuations and that's what concerns me it's the insinuations regarding the Garda, initial Garda claim about two or colleagues that have never been substantiated you know young work colleagues are not going to hang around in the piss and rain on a poor night or you just pop into your workplace for a cup of tea at 3.30 a.m. and in the piss and rain until what 402 a.m. They're still standing and light around out there waiting for you. No, sorry I don't buy it. I don't believe on Gardashi Akana ever bought it and they need to explain Why they put that crap out there or didn't shut it down or didn't come back and say we made a mistake That's wrong And it's up to Trevor's friends if somebody was there a work colleague who has not been identified to come forward and say yeah sorry that was me i was actually there but it's crap they weren't there no one has ever work colleague wise said they were there they parted after book wallies while waiting for pender trevor logs on and sends an email in subsequent interviews trevor's family have described the contents of this email as not significant he also leaves himself reminders of things to do the next day. After 10 minutes, the two men have coffee in the staff canteen before Pender, <coughs> Pender returns to work. <coughs> um, I have a slightly different interpretation of the activity Trevor was doing at his PC, you know, replying to emails. <coughs> it's it, the suggestion seems to be that um, Trevor was kind of planning to catch up on work. Maybe he thought he was going to be in a little bit later the following day. You know, setting reminders of things he was doing the following day. I don't buy that. I think by 4 a.m. Trevor had already made his mind up that the likelihood he was going to be in in time for work or turning up for work the following day was limited. And what he was doing was being responsible. It was nearly 3, 4 a.m. in the morning. What he was doing is getting ahead. So if I'm not in work tomorrow, I need to chase up a few emails here. I'll do it now, get it done, and that way I'm not chasing my tail when I turn back up on Monday. I think that's what was going on that evening, and that's why Trevor turned up oddly at 3, 4 a.m. in the morning. That's what he was doing. He knew it was unlikely he was going to turn up for work the following day. So he thought, I'm passing. Maybe he spoke to Carl Pender, maybe he didn't. I'll go in, 
Jesus, there's a few, I, I, there's some things I need, we all do it in work, there's some things I need to deal with immediately. I go in, I chase them up, I see that they reply, do I need to reply? I get all on top of that, and then I get home, and then I don't have to worry as much about if I don't turn up tomorrow. So I think he already was in two minds that whether he was turning up for work the following day. At 4.03, I think it was 4.02, but nearly 4.03 a.m., Trevor leaves the office carrying a corporate ACC uh, bank uh, golf umbrella described in some reports as navy and in others as blue on CCTV. He struggles for a moment to get the umbrella upright. Uh, again, watch the CCTV uh, footage. What has only more recently been disclosed is the clear activity of two other men close by during that half hour. Four oh five AM Trevor leaves a voicemail uh, for Glenn Cullen. This is one of his friends. According to Glenn, the message said, Hi Glenn, I've missed you there. Just on my way home. All going good. I'll talk to you tomorrow. A words to very close effect. That was the Irish Times on the twenty eighth, reported on the twenty eighth of the third, twenty fifteen. So you can see how retrospectively information was coming out year i mean this is like hello 15 years after glenn also says that he and another friend connor uh, lonan had arranged to meet up with trevor the following evening this would have been the friday uh, the 8th in thomas fletcher's pub in nace however according to trevor's father michael Dee, he quoted in the same article trevor told his family went home on tuesday december the 5th that he was going to stay in Dublin over the weekend and go uh, Christmas shopping. Um, yeah, uh, this is when Trevor got back from his Alaska trip. Uh, so he's back in work uh, December the 5th, which is uh, I think the Tuesday, uh, and says, oh no, this weekend, a uh, Christmas party coming up on the Thursday. Uh, no, I think I'll stay over the weekend. Uh, I think I'm gonna stick to close range uh, in Dublin I don't know when that um that arrangement came up with his two friends. Uh, it could have been organised on the Wednesday or Thursday prior, uh, 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 after uh, Trevor said that to his parents. Uh, I wouldn't read too much into it. Nace, is, Nace from Dublin is not that far away. Um, you can go for a night out with Nace and meet friends and still end up back in Dublin depending on how long you want to stay out. Um, so I wouldn't read that and too much into that. And in a young man's mind of that time, uh, heading out to Nice and heading back to Dublin, he may not have associated it with meaning I was going to be outside of Dublin. Yeah, Nice is in Kildare, the close by county. But, you know, I, I, I think maybe too much has been read into that. And we don't know when that arrangement was made. I suspect if he came back in the 5th. <coughs> and he spoke to his parents on the 5th. And said no he was staying in Dublin for the weekend. That was his intention. But just going for a 3 or 4 hour trip to Nice. And back to meet friends. And back to Dublin. In his mind may not have suggested I, I'm not spending you know, the weekend in, in Dublin. I, I, so I'm, I, I'm not inclined to read too much into that. The Gardaí did not seek to retrieve mobile me the message for, uh, left for Glenn on the basis that it was not relevant. Yeah, well, hello, I would say everything's relevant. But there you go. 4.14 a.m. CC footage, CCTV footage. Shows a man identified as Trevor walking past the AAB bank on Haddington Road. It's now uh, Milano's Peach Shop. Obviously, you must remember a lot, an awful lot of the areas that you'll see in CCTV footage have uh, changed since then. This is uh, a case 21 years ago. A direct route which would bring him back to his apartment by Ballsbridge Sandy Mount. I've shown that Trevor's apartment, uh, see the images uh, I showed you, was still a 20 25 minute walk away from the bank at Wilton Terrace where he worked and stopped off. He had already traversed across the Grand Canal Bridge 
when later picked up on the final CCTV footage. Even in media reports, far too often, the earlier CCTV footage from the rear of the asset management building, Wilton Terrace, 3.37-4.03 a.m., with the later Haddington Road footage at 4.14 a.m., are confused, conflated, or assumed to be immediately close by. They're not immediately close by. There's a travelling distance to get from the asset management building to the actual Haddington Road. So this is in connection to man in black, clad black, uh, following Trevor on Haddington Road. There is some, di you know, so there is some, if it's the same man, 402 leaving asset management building, up with the umbrella, off down the road to get home, 414, 12, 13 minutes later, man in black clad, appears to be same man following Trevor. That's a very definitive move and action. This isn't somebody to just, I just happen to be walking the same way as you 12 or 13 minutes later. Crap. This man was following Trevor for whatever reasons. We know it took Trevor some 10 minutes to travel that distance and it suggests he was walking at a slow pace and that period was when he was checking his phone messages and phony voicemailing his friend Glenn Cullen. Far too many idle theories have risen over years by suggesting Trevor somehow had a drunken mishap and fell in the canal or later uh, the uh, River Dodder uh, crossing. Again. I've shown in the maps that Trevor had already passed over the Grand Canal uh, bridge and I know searching did happen there in the waters but Trevor had already passed over that we know he was further on towards his home when he last went missing ok it's Map time. This is Wilton Terrace, where my cursor is. Okay, you can see it by the red dot there. Wilton Terrace. We're in the top left corner. I'm actually familiar with this area, and I'm familiar closer to the time that Trevor disappeared. I actually trained as a journalist in this area about 10 years before in Mesbal Road so I know the area well there are only two possible places Trevor could have crossed the canal the Mesbal Road junction here or slightly further up on one of the main roads which is where I suspect he joined onto Haddington Road which is where the CCTV footage is is on this side and it's on this side of the canal and there are multiple large buildings in between on this side of the canal so this suggestion as well that Trevor accidentally fell in the Grand Canal is nonsense the CCTV footage shows him on Haddington Road on the other side already well past the Grand Canal and turning into his two possible routes and the main route and this is pretty much the only route he would have taken along here what's fascinating is on this route as you follow it down he has two choices when he gets here he can either head slightly this way towards Lansdowne Road or he can go more south and go this way to Serpentine Avenue this is where he lived it's about a 20-25 minute journey and either way this way or this way is 27-26 minute walk 
What's notable, and in fairness, this is a modern map, but it's not dramatically changed. There are still so, some significant places on this stretch that are notable. And again, it goes back to CCTV. Just look at the places. You know, I don't think Amazon was there at the time, but that's back much further in. But along here, <coughs> this run is known as the Embassy Run. An embassy. Think about that. I want you to think about that. Embassies. We've got the Embassy of Romania. We've got the United States Embassy further down that road. Here. Embassy of Mexico. Now again, CCTV footage in this area is not going to pick up, you know, from here, the Embassy of Romania, Mexico. But certainly here, the American Embassy is going to pick up Trevor as he walked by. You know, it's nuts to think that we don't have more CCTV footage taken at the time because they're along this route which is a main thoroughfare there are significant landmarks which would have been embedded and laden with cctv footage down here the royal dublin society the rds the rds car parking further down Pembroke Wanderers Hockey Club. There are so many venues, outlets, businesses that would have had American Embassy, that would have had CCTV. Why have we not had CCTV footage from the multitude of venues along this route? Now, granted, here, if you've got a Lansdowne Road, it's a lot quieter, certainly. And there's, as you can see, there's a hell of a lot less venues here. I think Trevor was sensible enough that he would not have taken this more northerly route around Lansdowne. I think he would have stuck to this route. Okay, that's it for us on the map. And I think that's important. So this idea that he somehow was drunk or fell in a river. One only has to watch the images of Trevor. It does not suggest in any way, shape or form that Trevor was somehow incapacitated, inebriated. No one that evening who spoke to him later on, in particular Carl Pender, who was the last to speak to him in detail, in the asset management building has suggested in any way shape or form that trevor was incapacitated or somehow couldn't make it home or would stumble into a river you know it just doesn't fit subsequent passer passers by included a man 30 seconds behind followed by a young girl and then by a couple the couple are subsequently identified would say that they do not remember trevor specifically or anything untoward skilled behavior analysis studied the cctv footage received text messages to friends and emails he sent from the bank of ireland asset management building that night nowhere was evidence found to suggest that trevor was somehow impaired by excessive alcohol consumption nor a danger to his own safety once on guard as carried out their initial searches for a body in the opening week, their working theory was always that there was a third party nefarious element involved. 9.30 a.m. This is obviously the following morning as such. So December the 8th. Trevor fails to turn up at work. No action is taken by the Bank of Ireland. I have no real issue with this considering the time and work environment. 
Trevor was not the only employee not to turn up at work the following day. I'm sure as word got around that Friday, staff were already wondering what on earth he was doing there at 3 to 4 a.m. the previous night for no reason. Like any office Christmas party, I'm pretty sure the intention was to deal with the no-show on Monday at work and let it be for someone who had a good work record. So in a sense what I'm saying there is <clears throat> I don't think there was initial concern on the Friday when Trevor didn't turn up to work. It was just put down to previous night work party. Um, yeah, look, it's no problem. He's a good employee. Haven't heard from him. Hasn't found in. But look, it's fine. And hey, guess what? Apparently, Carl Pender said he was here at three or four o'clock in the morning, chasing emails. I forgot to say, give him a couple slap, couple slack. Give him a break. Yeah, no problem. We won't chase it up. It's fine. Let it go. We'll talk to him maybe on Monday and say, look, it would have been helpful if you had a phone us or contacted us on Friday if you weren't coming in. But hey, whenever, it's not a major problem. Um, I've already seriously considered that the reason he did turn up at the assets uh, management building uh, at that ungodly hour was likely because he was then made the decision that he was not attending work the following day or would be in far later that than normal and wanted to ensure he was up to date on work hard response. I already said that. Sorry, December the 9th, 2000 uh, and on to Sunday, December the 10th, 2000. Okay, so we're into the weekend now. Trevor apparently hasn't been seen, hasn't turned up for work on the Friday. No contacts made with Trevor by Michael, Anne, Mark, or Pamela Dealey, his family members and siblings, uh, mother and father, with Trevor over the weekend. Michael Dealey says, I wouldn't be ringing him to find out how he was because he should have been working the next day. Okay, so you, you wouldn't bother, it would just assume he was in the work the following day, catch up by with him in the evening and ask him how the party went, did he enjoy himself, that kind of thing. It was only later in the day, it was very clear that, you know, maybe odd that he hasn't contacted us to burst with enthusiasm how great a night he had and how the party went, And but that didn't happen, but there was no panic. Again, understand me, this wasn't a family playing, you have to get home early, be a good boy because you have work tomorrow. <coughs> Remember, Trevor spoke to his family on a very regular basis, if not daily. But just because one day went amiss, that wouldn't necessarily be a concern. Trevor's other sister, Michelle, then working in London, you know, she's in London, remember, called his mobile probably four times over the weekend, Saturday, Sunday, without knowing he was missing. She had stated that she believed his phone rang. Ultimately, the phone went dead. It is not clear whether or not Glenn Cullen or Colin Connor Lunan remember they were meant to be meeting him I think on the was it the Friday evening out this is out in Nace and Kildare phone Trevor when he failed to turn up at Thomas Flesher's pub in Nace as arranged on sorry the Saturday night it was okay but again no major panic didn't hear from him. okay hasn't turned up okay they found him no answer okay no major panic there's a great deal the police investigation is not sharing in communications over that crucial weekend. So we're already seeing that there's lots of communications with Trevor. He, he's a very outgoing chap. He talks to an awful lot of people. Keeps in constant communication with his family. Um, so, you know, clearly people are not getting contact with Trevor between the Friday and Saturday and beginning maybe to start at this stage to wonder this is a bit odd and no text no phone call monday the 11th of uh, 2000 so this is after the weekend at some point during the day bank of ireland phones trevor's parents okay so they've obviously tried to contact uh, uh, trevor but haven't got hold of him so they say okay Trevor's parents next, so now there is a concern. He hasn't turned into work on Friday, and now he's not in work on Monday. This is definitely not like Trevor. 
So they contact Travis Parents uh, Home and Nace And by the way Just regarding um, The two friends he uh, Had arranged to meet in Nace Obviously His parents have a home in Nace So that's possibly why They were puzzled that he didn't turn up Because his parents have a home in Nace That's the family home So if Trevor went out with them He'd naturally maybe go straight home to his parents, stay there, and then go home to his apartment in Serpentine Avenue. So maybe that was why the two friends thought it a little unusual. So Monday, Trevor's mother, Anne Dee, Dee phones his father, Michael, in Dublin, and his brother, Mark, in Castlebar. Castlebar is way across, I think, County Offaly. Is it Mead, Offaly, uh, Midlands direction? Uh, so way, way away from Dublin. Mark Dealey says that he immediately had a sixth sense that something was wrong, cancelled work and started to drive to Nace, according to the Irish Times. In the same article, Michael Dealey says that on being phoned by his wife, he rang Trevor's mobile and went to his apartment, but did not have a key to get in, and no one answered when he rang the bell. Michael Dealey subsequently returned to Nace. Okay, so nobody has accessed Trevor's apartment at this stage on Monday afternoon. For the same piece, it is stated that after calling into Nace, Mark Dealey went on to Dublin, arriving in the afternoon. He called first to Copperface Jacks and then travelled out to Ballsbridge. The article does not state whether he entered Trevor's apartment. Yeah, I'm a bit puzzled about that. Um, I would imagine Brother Mark would surely have went to the apartment first of all, maybe didn't get access and then went to the places where he knew his brother had been that Thursday night. Okay. I can't speak to how parents react or behave in these circumstances. I can only conclude that he last spoke to his son in Copperface Jacks, knew he was not at his apartment, and simply was desperate to locate his son. That's regarding the father. It also says later that evening, Mark Dealey returned to Nace and accompanied by Glenn Cullen, reported Trevor's disappearance to Nace Garda Station. Okay. I don't know why it... Well, okay, it's the family home, Nace, but I'm not sure why it wasn't done in Dublin, but however, maybe that's just the detail. There appears to be some confusion as to the timing of the initial phone call to Anne Dealey. In the Irish Times interview, Mark Dealey said that his mother phoned him in Castlebar at 10.30 a.m. In his interview with the Sunday Independent, uh, the 23rd of 12, 2012, uh, Michael Dealey says that his wife phoned him in the afternoon. Okay, I'm not going to fuss about details there. I'm not going to pretend that I am still deeply troubled by gaps and lack of what evidential communication or plans Trevor and his friends had. Um, that coming weekend and I'm not going to fixate either on when people remember they made that phone call or where, where they went when they started getting concerned about Trevor uh, Tuesday the 12th uh, of December a search of Trevor's route home is carried out by the Dealey family and friends the Grand Canal is searched by a Garda sub aqua team and again remember we're not hearing much about his apartment. Remember. Serpentine Avenue. The apartment. We asked. Did he go home. On the Thursday before. the His work outing. The suggestion. To the phone call to his father. Is he did. He talked about the electricity being gone. So. It's pretty reasonable to assume. He, he went home. For at least a couple of hours before his works party on Thursday. So why aren't the Ungarda Shikana disclosing what they found in his apartment when Monday and Tuesday came along? When he was officially reported missing. And what they found in his apartment was everything still the same? Did it look like the apartment had been completely undisturbed since the Thursday evening he went out to his work. We're not hearing any of that. So there's huge missing gaps and details in this case that Ungarda Shikana are not disclosing. That are important. 
So, unfortunately now we're passing, sadly, from day to day. We're now passing into months. Uh, December to January 2000. Searches for Trevor continue, organised by Mark Dealey, who will not return to work until after Christmas. Michael Dealey similarly will not return to work for six months after Trevor's disappearance. Flyers posted with Trevor's picture are handed out and posted around the Ballsbridge Dublin 2 area. Garda Subacra divers also searched the Dodder River. No trace of Trevor is found. Trevor's friend, Conlet Lunan, a CCTV expert, succeeds in sourcing AIB footage showing Trevor passing the bank in Haddington Road. The footage was located only shortly before it was due to be destroyed. What the fuck is Conlet Lunan fair play to him as a CCTV expert having to take on this resp what the fuck were the Ungardi Shikana doing? That's their job to do. Not a friend. That's crazy. December the 23rd, 2012. Michael Dilly gives an interview to the Sunday Independent regarding Trevor's disappearance. This is the first interview to give any detailed information about the night of Trevor's disappearance. February to March 2015. You can see now we're winding away the years. Nothing is being disclosed. We are still, even at February, March 2015, still stuck with our grainy footage of man in black clad um, talking to Trevor at the gates of the asset management building. That's what the public were left with. Are Ongarda Shikana twilling their thumbs or are they just not telling us details that they know more about in this case? The Irish Times carries a detailed three-part series on Trevor's disappearance, including interviews with his father, Michael Dealey, his brother, Mark Dealey, his sister, Michelle Dealey, and his friend, Glenn Cullen. Michelle Dealey, who was in London at the time of her brother's disappearance, says, <coughs> Nothing has been found. There's been zero, zero information or findings. I don't believe people vanish. That makes no sense to me. That's the most agonising thing. It actually starts to hurt your brain when you think about it. Michelle also states in relation to the fact that Trevor's phone was never located or pinpointed via its network. Oh dear, oh dear. Michelle continues. I don't accept that on Gary Sheikhan the Gary could have done more at the time. Fair enough. Michelle says. I know it wasn't as advanced as today, which is quite right it wasn't, but it was still the mobile phone era. It wasn't back in the day when there was nothing electronic or digital. And she's quite right. Three years later, Joe O'Reilly, primarily based on mobile phone data, would eventually, eventually, mobile data in 2003 gathered and resourced at that time, would be primarily convicted for the butchering and murder of his wife in Nall. Now, if they could do that three years later, there was at least some digital detail or capture of network data for Trevor's phone. And yet we've never heard of that. And I've touched upon it with the communications and how affable and communicative Trevor was. And yet there are very limited details we have on Trevor at that time. Journalist Donald McIntyre produced a documentary in the, into the disappearance of Trevor Dealey. The documentary included a screen grab of CCTV footage from outside Trevor's office not previously released by Gardaí. And why not? The documentary mistakenly describes this footage as depicting Trevor entering the building. In fact, it was taken shortly after Trevor had entered the building and shows two men referred to above. Remember, the ones referred to by police as colleagues. This really is embarrassing by Angarda Shikana. How this nonsense all started about two colleagues and they were explained by two 
Now what fucking happened here is they got exposed by a journalist. They got caught out by a journalist who got hold of this CCTV footage and then stumbled, you know, and apologised or didn't apologise and tried to explain it away. Those two men at that gate were not colleagues of Trevor Dealey. December 2016, it is reported that a new investigation is to be opened into the disappearance of Trevor Dealey and that a review of CCTV footage is also part of the investigation with video footage of Trevor's last known movements being sent <coughs> excuse me, to specialists in the UK for detailed forensic examination. April 2017, it is reported that a UK company has been able to dramatically enhance relevant CCTV foot, uh, images leading to a suspicion that the man 30 seconds behind Trevor on Haddington Road may be the same man outside the building talking briefly to Trevor as he entered. Detailed footage of the man outside the building of a standard similar to the screen grab shown in the McIntyre documentary but ending prior to the time of the screen grab is released by Gardy showing Trevor talking to the man before he enters the building. No clarification was provided regarding the relationship of this footage with the conversation with the security guard Peter reported to Barry Cummins to have taken place at the time of Trevor entering the building. The footage does however corroborate Mr Cummins' account which referenced a chain having been taken off the gate by the security guard insofar as it shows the chain merely looped across the gate. The above timeline of events raises a number of questions. Why has there been no attempt by Angarda Shikana to relate the enhanced footage of the man met by Trevor on his way into the office with Barry Cummins' account of the security guard Peter encountered by Trevor at this very point? Remember? Peter? Delivery? Internal mail, I'll take the lock off the gate. I won't relock it. Why am I not relocking it? Mm. Oh, that's right. Travis just contacted me, he's arriving. We don't know that, but was that what was going on? Why don't we have footage of Peter taking the internal mail on CCTV? It's the same damn CCTV footage. Where is it? Why haven't we seen it? Why hasn't it been released? Why has it been alleged that this footage was significantly enhanced in circumstances where the Donald McIntyre documentary broadcast some years earlier shows a screen grab of footage similar in standard to that recently released? Donald McIntyre gave that the footage enhanced. Why couldn't Ungarda Shikana? Why has there been an attempt by Gardy to suggest that this enhanced footage shows that the man in the footage outside Trevor's workplace was the same man behind him on Haddington Road when an examination of the footage shows no public evidence to support this? Again, we're working on assumptions here. We assume the man clad in black is the same man. It looks like him. But what evidence do Ungardy Shikana have that it is actually the same man. Fuck all, I would say. And if they do, they need to come forward and state that. Why has there been no mention of Trevor's two colleagues outside the gate before now? Suppose the two colleagues. What two colleagues? Been very quiet, haven't they? If there was two colleagues there. It's crap. Why did this information, where did this information come from? If they were there and standing next to the person of interest, surely they could be added more to details about them. It's crap. Why has the focus to date been almost exclusively on the period before rather than after Trevor was last seen? I've laid out the details as to why I question a lack of investigation into the time after Trevor disappeared rather than the focus on before he disappeared. 
Many possibilities have been suggested in this case, but in reality, we know nothing of what happened, Trevor, after 4.15 to 4.30 a.m. on the night of his disappearance. After 21 years, even the police have yet to account for his movements or even confirm Trevor Dealey ever did or did not return to his apartment. The assumption is he didn't. But that is all it is, an assumption without evidence disclosed. According to Barry Cummins, Trevor's flatmates were both away on holiday. On the night of Trevor's disappearance, it was a horrible wet and cold night and there was a taxi strike. Everyone was walking close to the city centre. A lad in his 20s, out until 4 to 5 a.m., going home to a quiet apartment, maybe isn't going to be a jack-in-the-box at 9 a.m. after a work party the following day. We know that there were difficulties in entering Trevor's apartment on Monday. When did this entry finally occur and by whom? And who was it supervised by? Did Gardy carry out a full search of the apartment and what, if anything, was there to convince them that Trevor had not returned home in the early hours of that morning? None of these details have ever been revealed in this missing persons case of Trevor Dealey. August 2017. Gardy launched a search at a wooded area in Chapel Lizard, Dublin. Although a gun was discovered at the site, no human remains were found and investigators have been reluctant to link the firearm to the young man's disappearance. The search was called off in September that year and Gardy said they had not found anything at the site that would assist them in helping to locate Trevor. They have never disclosed what the nature and detail of the tip that led to this location. A lot of that was, was it a criminal stash? Was it just based on assumption, hearsay, rumour? We don't know. Again, on Garda Shikana, I've never explained this. As with all missing person cases, we have only some detail and more detail the public need if they are to be encouraged to help. There is clearly a great deal in this case that is being insinuated and hinted both by law enforcement and the general public. However, a police investigation and ca casual public speculation are worlds apart. That's unhelpful in any inquiry and investigation. I believe the Gardaí, the Irish police, could bring clarity to this after 21 years. And I think it's sad that after 21 years, and in particular as we record now, December 2021, just what, uh, a week, t uh, 12 days after the anniversary of his disappearance, his 21 year um, disappearance, I think it's sad that Ungarda Shikana have brought absolutely nothing extra to this case despite it being very clear that there are details they could disclose. They know or they suspect the identity of at least two or three of the men outside the Bank of Ireland that night. They know young Trevor Dealey was not complicit in his own disappearance and demise. They do not know when his life ended and never treated his apartment as a crime scene. They have concealed information and tips to them that completely change the complexion of this investigation. They have never openly admitted their belief is that a nefarious element is involved in this case. I'd, as I said, I'd hoped that on the 21st anniversary, the police would have made a more renewed appeal and disclosed more of what they suspected and the people involved at the time and their primary line of inquiry. Once again, this has not happened. It was left to the family. Why is that important? Because it leaves a slight and an implication on the character of a missing person. It's painful for the Dealey family and fuels public speculation that an historic investigation team is still flapping around wildly 
for ideas, motives and reasons after 21 years. Yeah, I won't even bother reading that out. You can see the phone numbers there. Uh, if it counts, you can phone on Garda Shiakana at that number or Crime Stoppers. But on Garda Shiakana, need to do a hell of a lot more in this case. And I would hope in a year's time, come the 22nd anniversary, they'll get off their backsides and tell us a little bit more about what they suspect in this case. We're done now on this timeline. Okay, that completes our uh, review of the Trevor Dealey uh, case and timeline. Obviously, if you have any information to give, uh, particularly uh, in regards to the Trevor Dealey family, um, it's, you know, 21 years since he went missing uh, they still have many questions if you have information please contact on Garda Shikana, the Irish police uh, and give them the information that gives resolution to that family uh, where are we uh, we're finishing up for the year this is our last uh, episode for 2021. We will be back in the new year. And uh, we're going to be coming up with an episode in probably early, maybe mid-January. And we're going to leave the uh, true crime uh, just for one program and um, we're going to be talking uh, more publishing writing I know people come to Radio Spoil for different reasons uh, and that's okay we dip into an awful lot of subjects that's fine Again, I want to thank you all for joining me. Uh, Radioaspoil.com, that's where you can find us. You'll get details of next episodes. Radio, uh, at Radio Aspoil Twitter. Um, where, uh, we do podcasts. Unfortunately, cases like this where I do true crime, really, they don't work well. I do put something up uh, for... Uh, podcasting channels but really uh, it's just a very short summary it, it doesn't work uh, you're better for our true crime you're better checking out um, YouTube and RadioSpoil.com itself okay so look, let's leave it there. Most importantly, uh, I'll see you early in the new year. I promise you, episode 17 is not far away. I've already got it organised with an interview guest. Um, as I say, it'll be about uh, the uh, publishing and writing world. Um, if you're interested in that, I know many of my early viewers were. Join in. Um, most importantly... God bless. Have a terrific and safe Christmas.